attention. And uh, one of my, of course, there were a lot of highlights from it. The, the uh, tower, what do you call it, lighthouse that we got to go to. But also, uh, Savannah is home to uh, really the place where John Wesley came and did some ministry there and, and encountered the Moravians. And I have a picture, but I don't have it today, uh, that I want to show maybe either Wednesday night or whatever. And uh, it's uh, the statue uh, of, and we got to go to this beautiful church there and just visit uh, as a kind of a tourist place uh, in Savannah. But it's great to be with you. I, I did get to hear the speaker on, if you haven't yet, uh, the speaker last Sunday did a fantastic job. And it was a, a really a well received. I appreciated that uh, Gideon speaker filling in for us. And so that's available online if you want to look at that. Join me if you would today. We're getting ready to start a new series uh, called uh, The Church God Desires. We're going to talk about the church and looking at specifically the, the churches in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Join me with the, uh, the prayer to the Holy Spirit. Next slide, please. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before you stand, I just have to tell you, it's great to have Larry, Sandy, and the gang back. And then when Larry came over here, I thought he was going to lead the singing and I was going to have to preach. So <laughs> I, I'm better now, okay? Uh, if you would, please stand. Let's sing number 384, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. <laughs> Oh, 
remain standing. Let's turn to number 881, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Is good and all the time. It's good to be in God's house this morning. We're glad our pastor and his wife had a good vacation and the family, and we're glad they're back with us today. This morning, for announcements, we have Sunday school at 10 a.m., worship services at 11. Our Gideon offering for May the 30th totaled $621. The flowers this morning are given in love by the family of Samantha Johnson to honor her birthday, which is the 8th. This coming week, Samantha gets a little bit older. So let's sing happy birthday to Samantha. Is there anybody else? Anybody else got a birthday? Had a birthday? Okay. This Wednesday night we'll be beginning a new study. Uh, the Church God Desires, Session 1, is characterized by love. And our question for the week is when you have done something, when have you done something crazy for love? Hmm. Online Bible study is at 5.30. In-person Bible study is at 6. Our June activities, uh, the 13th, which is next Sunday, we're going to have a celebration service and potluck dinner afterwards. Uh, we've got a sign-up sheet. If you've not signed up for anything, see me after church, and we'll get that taken care of. Anything and everything is welcome. We eat, we'll eat good next week. And a board meeting right after the dinner. The 20th is Father's Day, and our baby bottle offering for the Appalachian Pregnancy Care Center is due back. And the 27th is Salem's Maintenance Fund Offering Sunday. Also, today is Communion Sunday. There's a trash can by the back door. When you exit with your little cups, please throw those in the trash for us. Any other announcements? I have a picture, and it's actually. 
particularly the birthday gifts. And there's quite a few places that are busy. So this gives you a chance to uh, honor somebody for the birthday or the memory of, or just acknowledging somebody. Maybe there's somebody in the church that says that something special to you. And you want to honor them. So I'm going to pass it out and you all can sign up if you wish for the rest of the year. I just like to say how much we appreciate Sarah always behind the scenes doing the work and putting those together and so faithful and we just want to thank you Sarah. Well you couldn't stop me from doing it any. <laughs> This morning our prayer list is lengthy, uh, many people with cancer in the hospital, recovering from surgeries. We're thankful that our pastor's uh, granddaughter didn't have to have any extra skin grafts, but pray for her recovery from her accident she had. Uh, Erin Atkins is the little baby we've been praying for with cancer, and she's in remission right now. We're thankful for that. We're thankful God's answering prayers. Does anyone have a spoken prayer request this morning? If not, we'll ask our pastor to come lead us in prayer. It's uh, good to see all of all of you today, uh, and uh, Vanessa's family. Glad glad you're able to be with us, and thank God for prayers that have been answered in many different respects. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just take a moment to give God praise in our hearts as we think about the blessings of God. We also want to confess our sins to the Lord. this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. All right. Uh, thank you for the wonderful offering for the Gideons. The uh, Gideons do such a, a great work around the world with trying to get Bibles everywhere. And I know, uh, as you mentioned, when you go to motels, you'll see them. And uh, used to, they would take them to the schools and give them out. But a lot of places that's been banned, uh, so they have to stand outside the school ground sometimes. I don't know how, uh, how they're able to do that. Uh, I, I know that a lot of places, they can't actually go on the property. But we're thankful for the work that they do, and thank you for your offering and for your faithfulness in giving. And at this time, we are going to uh, do our offering, uh, our uh, doxology, if you would. if he would pray. 
They're there because we come to you again today. We do want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you for the blessings that we have to stay in our lives. We ask you to listen to this service and let us pray that you would open our hearts so that we can hear the word and grow with it and grow with what it says. And it's a blessing to be at home. This service, God, and this word should go forward. God, as we know, you give us more each day than we deserve. I just want to thank you for what you give, what you give to us. And I want to thank you, dear God, for the way we use it. As this offering goes forth and make sure for God, I pray that you bless what we are fortunate to give and that we can all be found given with a free heart to those who need. Again, dear God, be with us here in this service. Bless us for a good service. And I pray for you. In the name of God. Amen. <laughs> I've asked uh, Ron is going to come up uh, and do the lady moment today uh, before he reads the scripture and uh, the, just talk about some of the things going on in, in the Methodist church. Thank you. On the uh, screen you will see a uh, symbol of a church. This is a church that uh, is not in existence yet. It's a church that may come into existence uh, maybe in September of 2022. The United Methodist Church is uh, splitting. There's uh, no secret about that and there's much talk about it. And it's been in earnest since the 2016 General Conference when it was apparent that uh, uh, there could not be reconciliation for some of the uh, uh, philosophies that the established United Methodist Church had with uh, traditionalists in the church. And so uh, a group of uh, conservative Bible-based uh, pastors uh, spearheaded by the good news, the you, some of you may have seen that magazine, the Good News magazine, um, formed a, an association, the Wesley Covenant Association. And through their leadership, a proposal has been uh, uh, put together that would uh, try to have an amicable uh, separation of the church from the traditionalist and uh, the established United Methodist Church. It's not an easy thing. Not an easy thing to uh, dissolve uh, a congregation of uh, millions and uh, have them uh, go their separate ways. There's three big questions to be resolved. One is, how is there going to be a division of the hundreds of millions of dollars in cash that is held by the United Methodist Church. Who does that go to? In what proportions? How are the pensions to be protected of the thousands of pastors who have paid into pension funds for many years, active and retired pastors? And how would uh, they ensure that congregations would be able to keep their property, uh, the actual buildings, if they uh, left the United Methodist Church. Uh, most of you know probably, but some of you may not, that when John and Louis Emma Chafin deeded this property to the uh, Salem Church, it really is deeded to the United Methodist Church. Uh, it's needed to this congregation to hold in trust for the United Methodist Church. If we decided to leave the United Methodist Church right now, this building would still belong to the United Methodist Church. We would not hold legal title to it. And so there wanted to be uh, some type of arrangement where churches, congregations that choose to leave the United Methodist Church, if they do, would be ensured that they could hold their property. This plan uh, had a long name, but it was a protocol and plan for a way forward. 
something like that, which was called, was to be presented at the 2020 General Conference for a vote. But due to the uh, uh, pandemic, that conference was continued until uh, August uh, 29th of 2021. In February, uh, this past February, the decision was made not to hold that conference in August of 21, but to delay it until August 29th of 2022. So that is the time that that protocol will be, be voted upon. And if that protocol is adopted by the United Methodist Church at large, uh, each congregation will have to make a decision of whether or not to uh, stay with the United Methodist Church, in which case they would need to do nothing, or to leave but not be affiliated with any church association, or to leave and affiliate with a different church. Uh, I believe many churches will choose to affiliate with the Global Methodist Church, the church that is uh, being uh, constructed now, and there is much to do to, to do that. They have a uh, book of discipline and doctrine uh, that is somewhat similar to the United Methodist Church. Uh, some of the tenets of that is that there's much more accountability uh, for pastors and bishops. And bishops would not serve life terms. Uh, they would be pastors who after a set term would go back to either pastoring a church or doing some other work within the church. There would be no trust clause uh, in uh, property. Each congregation would hold their own property uh, in fee and it would not belong to the Global Methodist Church or, or any other body. So there's some differences and there's uh, some other aspects of that, but there would be plenty of time to uh, decide on what this church would want to do. Uh, but that time will approach in September. It starts August 29th and it runs for about seven days, that conference will, and after which uh, soon after which each church will have to make that decision. So I wanted to bring that to your attention that uh, that's coming up and uh, you may want to uh, explore. Uh, there's a website for the Global Methodist Church that you can uh, go on and uh, see what they believe and uh, what their doctrines are and uh, follow that. So on that kind of a, a downer. I'm <laughs> kind of uh, remember a, a story that I've told from time to time. There was a man that was a very religious man and he was shipwrecked on an island. It wasn't a very big island. It was, uh, you know, like uh, a large football field or, or better than that. And uh, he was there for many years before he was found. and. When he was found, uh, they found him coming out of a church. He had constructed a, a church and there was a, had a cross on it and he was come out and he was overjoyed. And the, but the people that found him said, uh, you know, we noticed when we were uh, on the boat coming in here that there's a, a building up here that uh, looks a lot like your church. It's got a steeple on it. And uh, we was wondering what that is. And he said, oh, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> so, so divisions happen, and uh, we we live with those and adapt. So, the scripture lesson is from Revelation chapter two. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write: These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. 
I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is your credit. You hate the works of the Nic Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Let us pray. Father, we pray that we might be a, a steadfast congregation, that we might hold true to your teachings and unwaver. And we know that uh, it's not always easy to be a, a lampstand and maintain a lampstand in a community, Father. We pray for the power and the wisdom and the endurance to do that. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we're doing a fine job in presenting some of the difficulties and challenges facing the, the Methodist Church. I think it's interesting and ironic on this day that we also are beginning our study on the seven churches and talking about some of the issues that they had as well in the book of Revelation. And I want to say, you know, I, I had the opportunity to go to uh, some of the beginnings. That I was at the first meeting that they had in Chicago, actually, of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, and uh, went to one at Asbury, and uh, there's some great people, and many of those people uh, love the Lord, and they love the Scripture, and uh, also know some people on the more progressive side, and I want to say that they also, I believe, love the Lord. Uh, there are just some fundamental differences in the beliefs of many of the people today. And so the church has come to the point where we realize that um, it might be time for, as Ron said, an amicable separation. That's not a bad thing always. Uh, understand that uh, what does that mean for us here as a local church? Well, as far as our day-to-day -day operations, it doesn't change a whole lot. We're still going to preach like we're preaching. We're, you know, the same Jesus that uh, bought us, the same Jesus will take us through to the other side. So we're not changing our, our preaching. We're not changing our, our you know, doctrine and all that. We're still uh, going forward. But it might mean some some other changes as far as looking forward and as far as we hope to be able to stay right here in this building and that's the plan uh, just might have a different name or something we don't know the truth is until that happens we don't know but what i want to say is this uh, sometimes people want to abandon the ship when things get tough and the storms begin to come but i want to say today i think that we ought to just ride out the storm and stay in it together because as a group of people this this congregation I believe uh, is able to look at things and, and make decisions and you know I think uh, we have a wonderful congregation a wonderful congregation and I believe that uh, we'll we'll all have to make some decisions and, and we'll all be involved in those decisions but that's down the road we don't know and so we just wanted to let you know because I know a couple years ago I was on vacation and uh, we went to a little Methodist church, and uh, I spoke to the pastor there, and I said, so what do you people think about all this, the things that's going on uh, in, the, in the church world today? And, and he said, I don't think they even know anything's going on. They don't know anything about it. And so what I don't want to do, I don't want to make it something we talk about all the time, but I do want us to be aware and informed. And so thank you, Ron, for doing that. So we're starting a, a new series of... The church that God desires. What is the kind of church that the Lord desires today? And what is the kind of church that you want to be a part of? It's a good question. So I want to begin this uh, with a video clip, just kind of a promo of, of our study that we're going to be talking about. Want to know if a restaurant is any good? We check the reviews. Looking for a good dog groomer? Again, we go online and check the reviews. 
Some people approach church with the same consumer mentality. They check church websites, even read comments about the church. They desire just the right church. But what kind of church does God desire? In the book of Revelation, Jesus had messages for seven specific churches, including things he praised them for and things he rebuked them for. In Bible Studies for Life, we look at Jesus' words to each of these churches. In the process, we will discover what God desires of us. We can become the church God desires. Okay, just give you a little idea of what we're talking about today. So, not long ago, during the height of the pandemic and things, uh, due to uh, some supply chain issues, uh, we had restaurants that were scrambling to uh, to find ketchup packets. You know, um, they weren't able to keep up with the de demand. There's other things like that's gone on during the pandemic. So now I hear that Chick-fil-A is limiting their dipping sauces, you know, as they th their supply chain issues come up and they've had a shortage of select items. Many locations are only giving one dipping sauce per menu, and uh, some may not be able to find dipping sauce. So this raises an important question today. Is it really worth having fries without ketchup? I, I, I know there's probably some more deeper theological issues that we could raise today, but I'll get to that in a minute. But, but you know, to, you know, to go to uh, have fries, kind of like cookies without milk, you know, just not the same. Uh, who wants to have cookies without milk? Well, I guess a few of you could say, well, I, I can eat fries just fine with no ketchup or chicken nuggets without sauce and all that. I, I guess that's possible to enjoy that, uh, I, I'm sure. But f for some of us, it, it just isn't the same. And there's another thing that you, you might be able to get by with that, but here in the book of Revelation, there is a pairing that you can't do without. And that is, basically, when a church is a church, and a church is doing good works, good works must always be accompanied by love. One without the other just doesn't work. And so we find in this church here, this first church that we're looking at, the church of Ephesus, that uh, the main point is that we need to ground everything we do in love for Christ. Everything we do should be out of love for Christ because not only our actions will be uh, looked at, but our motives behind why we do what we do. Why do we go to a certain church or why do we do a certain act? Is it for the right reasons? So I want to begin with the, kind of the big picture here. First of all, Christ commends this church for many things. Look at what is some of the things. He, he, uh, the Ephesus was a serving church. They were full of energy. In verse 2 he says, Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So they were a serving church, full of energy and life. Secondly, it was a discerning church, marked by orthodoxy. He says in verse 2, You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. So it was a church that was not only serving but discerning. And then thirdly, it was a persevering church, known for its stability. Jesus said, you have persevered and you have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Verse 3. Yet, Christ says in verse 4, I hold this against you. I've got something here that I want to talk about. And so after commending the church for some of the good things that you could say about it, he talks about something that is a problem in this church. Then Christ, he says, I hold this against you, and he says this, Remember from where you have fallen, in verses 1 through 5. That's an interesting term there. And depending on which version of the Bible you have, you might get a different flair on that. 
For example, the New International Version says it like this, Consider how far you have fallen. How far you have fallen. I'm not real happy with that particular translation. I like the NIV, but in this part I don't think it really captures the heart of what he's saying here. The New King James Version is much better. The New King James says, Remember there for from where you have fallen. It's the idea there that we understand there was a place where we were, and we no longer are there. But the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version that Ron read from, that our Pew Bibles are in, I, I like real well, says it like this, and I think this really captures the heart of it. He says, Remember then from what you have fallen. Remember from what you have fallen. And so the idea there is to understand that either you want to say where or what, but there was a person and a place that we were at one time and we're no longer there. So sometimes we need to remember, we need to contemplate, we need to reflect on where we are and where we were and where we're headed. And that's good for every church to do. Looking at this is where we were at one time, this is where we are, this is where we're going. And every individual can do the same thing. But then he says, secondly, in verse 5, to repent. So first of all, remember. Secondly, repent. The word repent is not a word we like to use much anymore, but it simply means to have a change of mind. To have a change of mind about our sin or ourselves. Uh, when we re repent, we acknowledge something. We acknowledge basically that what God is saying is true and we're agreeing with God. That's what the word in 1 John confess means, homilageo means, that we agree with God, that we're saying, Yes, Lord, I agree that I am wrong and you're right. I agree that I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness. That is every person in this building. That is not them out there. That is us in here. That every one of us, every day of our lives, need to come to the cross and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Because we're all sinners, by the way. There's a church. I get a little tickled sometimes every time I drive here to church. But there's a church on the way here, and I'm not going to mention the name of it, but they got a sign out front, a big old sign that says, Sinners Welcome. And I always laugh at that when I go back because I think, are they saying they're not sinners? I understand what they're trying to say, I guess. But it's almost like an us and them attitude. Like we are holy, you're sinners, and we might let you walk through the door. But here's the thing. In the Methodist Church, you know, some of the things that, that they're talking about that's going on in the Methodist Church, the idea is not about who we're going to welcome into our church. That's not what it's about. I, I hope that's not what it's about. Because the motto of the Methodist Church has always been open hearts, open minds, and open doors. That anyone who wants to is welcome to come into our building. And we don't say we don't stand at the door and and say, well, you know, who are you? And and, and make a you know like a, some kind of a club where we have to weigh in whether they're going to come in the building or not. We don't do that because we're all sinners. So it's not about who is really allowed to come in or welcome to our church. It really comes down. It's a it's a matter of about clergy and what we're going to do with clergy. And that's a talk for another time. But the point I want to say is this today, that we all have something to repent of. And that we need to realize that and, and confess our sins. And there's a lot of people today who are just too prideful to do that. There's just too much pride for us to admit we're wrong. We're like the Fonz on, you know, Happy Days who could never say he was wrong. And we have a hard time sometimes confessing. And it's just plain pride. It's just plain pride, that's all it is. 
we're like the Pharisee who says, you know what, I, I, I know that I may make mistakes, but I'm not like that fellow. I'm not as bad as that guy or that lady. I'm, I don't do what they do. And I give all this and I do all this. And God ought to be happy to have me in His building. But Jesus says, I have someone against you. Remember from where you've fallen and repent of your failures. Repentance. It's a necessary ingredient in having a relationship with God. Maybe we'd like to take that word out of the Bible. And then we might all take the cross out of the Bible too. To have a religion without the cross and a religion without repentance, it's no religion at all. There's a song, it's a new song, it's new to me, uh, by Casting Crowns. It's called Start Right Here. It says, the words go like this. We want our coffee in the lobby. We watch our worship on a screen. We got a rock star preacher who won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pockets. We keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our cities, would we even cross the street? Church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. And Lord, I'm starting right here. And I'm starting right now. Repentance. Jesus said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. It was what the Jews, the Jewish people, felt many of them to recognize that in order for them to see the kingdom of God there was they needed to repent and acknowledge Christ. So here's what he says to do. Remember, repent, and then finally return. Return to our first love. Jesus says I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now what is he saying there? Because I think the entire message hinges on this one phrase. So we need to get it. We need to understand what he's saying. And there's different ways, there's at least three ways that this has been interpreted and I've heard it preached. What does he mean when you have forsaken your first love? Well, he could mean, as some believe, that we're no longer a loving church. Some look at this as more as like brotherly love. Church, here's a church big on truth, but it needs more emphasis on love. And there may be situations where that's true, but I don't think that is what Christ is saying here. I don't think that's what he's speaking about. Uh, because he's not speaking about love in general, but he's talking about your first love. The first love of the Christian, the first love of the church has to be our love for God. That's where it is. Christ said the most important command is to love your Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And the second is love your neighbors as yourself. Of all the commandments, and the Jews, you know, they had you know, in, counted in the Old Testament law 613 precepts or commandments. And they asked Jesus, which is the most important? And Jesus gave them this quote. So the first is to love God with all your heart, but the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So when Christ speaks of our first love, he's not talking about our second love. So he must be talking about our love for God. I don't think he's necessarily talking about our love for our neighbor, although those go together. Another way this can be interpreted is that you lost your earliest love. You lost the excitement that you had when you were first a Christian. You've lost that enthusiasm, the passion, and you need to get it back. But is that really what he's saying here? 
are we really expected to go back 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years when we first got saved and try to do, recapture that enthusiasm that we once had? I don't think that's what he's saying. You know, in a healthy marriage, love deepens over time. It gets stronger. And the earliest love, if we go back, is rarely the best love. I mean, yes, we, there's passion and enthusiasm and all that, but, but it's stronger if you love the person you're with. It gets stronger. And Christ doesn't say you've lost your earlier love. He said you have forsaken your first love. And who is the first love of the church? The church is the bride of Christ, right? We are married to Christ, and our first love is the bridegroom, which is Christ. Christ is basically saying, you have forsaken your first love, you have forsaken me. So here is a church that's doing all these great things, and they're very busy, but they've forsaken Christ. It's like the woman who says to her husband, I'm not happy anymore. And he looks at her and he says, what do you mean you're not happy? I work hard. I do all this for you. I provide all these things. You've got more than you can ever imagine or want. What more could you possibly want? And she looks at him and says, I want you. I want you to love me. And I think, in a way, that's what Christ is saying. You know, and that's one of the things in Matthew 25 when He judges the nations. And He says to the people, and He puts the sheep and the goats, and He says, look at all, He said, you, all the blessings, things that you did. You, you, you fed these people. You helped these people. You clothed these people. You visited these people when they were sick. And they say, when do we do that, Lord? And he says, as much as you did it on the least of these, you did it to me. And then he says the other side, I was sick, I was in prison, I was destitute, and you did not help me. You did not, he didn't say you didn't help them, he said you didn't help me. You didn't help me personally. And he said, when did we fail to help you? When did we see you in need and fail to help you? And he says, as, when you did it not to the least of my brothers, you did it not unto me. And then many of them will say to him, Wait a minute, Lord. Look at all the great things we did for you. We did all these wonderful, wonderful works for you. And Jesus will look at them and say, I never had a relationship with you. I didn't know you. So you really weren't doing it for me. I mean, what an indictment <laughs> on a church to realize a church like this is doing all these things, but somehow they've missed the most important part. It's kind of like I remember playing basketball back in high school, and I was pretty quick in those days, but there was a couple times I was a little too quick because I'd get the ball passed and I'd take off before I got the basketball, you know, and the basketball would be back there. I remember that happening once or twice. And the truth is, we, if, we t if we go in this life full speed without Christ and loving Christ, we've left the ball behind. We've missed it somehow. And so he says, you have forsaken Christ. Forsaken your first love means you've forsaken Christ. In all the busyness of life, Christ is no longer front and center. Your life has become about something else. Christ says this to the church, your ministry is thriving, your statement of faith is sound, your commitment to hard work is exemplary, you are serving, discerning, and a persevering church, but you're no longer a church who loves Christ. The NRSV says you have abandoned the love you had at first. You have abandoned the love you had at first. You are no longer that in that place that you once were. There's a lot of energy. There's orthodoxy. You, you got the doctrine down. You're overcoming all kinds of difficulties and obstacles and you have a marvelous history. You have great leaders. But you've missed the mark. It's no longer 
about me. On the video they were showing earlier, I don't know if you caught that, but they were talking about how some people choose what church they go to. And sometimes, a lot of times, people will pick a church based on what that church can do for them and how that church could help them. When really what we should be doing is, Lord, where can I go that I can serve you? Where can I be that I can be the most of use and help someone else? Is there a pastor? Is there a church that needs me? Rather than saying, you know, that church has a really cool band, and I really like the way they dance, or that, ter that church has a great uh, sound system, or they have a great program for my kids. I mean, is that really the way we should be picking a church? Or should we be saying, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but I'm saying that's not the reason we choose a church. It should be where we can serve God and love God and where we can grow. And he says, it's no longer about Christ. And I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Interesting, there was no gross sin in this church. There was no hidden scandal that was going on in this church that was a problem. It wasn't about that. It was simply that they no longer had the love and they weren't doing what they were doing out of love for Christ. They were doing it for the wrong reason. And I've known people who have uh, either come out and said or, or in, in kind of in between the lines said, you know, I picked that church because it was good for my business. I knew a lot of contacts would be there. God help us. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, you can have all these wonderful gifts. You can even do all kinds of incredible things and even self-denial and self-mutilation. Give your body to be burned or whatever. But if you have not love, then you're just noise. You're just going through the motions. You've got to have that love. What do you, the husband says to the wife, what more could you want? What more could I give you? And she says, I want you. I want you. I'm going to read the rest of that song. Start right here. I'm like the brother of the prodigal who turned his nose and puffed his chest. He didn't run off like his brother, but his soul was just as dead. What if the church on Sunday was still the church on Monday too? What if we came down from our towers and walked a mile in someone's shoes? It's got to start right here. It's got to start right now. Lord, I'm starting right here. Lord, I'm starting right now. What about you? What about you? Jesus says, love me. Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Yeah, you know I love you, Lord. Jesus is asking us the same question. Start right here. Start right now. Let's pray as the musicians come. Father, today, we know we know that there are times in our lives where we allow things to overtake us in the busyness of life and the stress of life. We find ourselves going through the motions. We're singing the words, but the melody is not reaching our heart and the words aren't reaching our heart. God, help us to come back to you. May we return to the God of our fathers. May we repent of our sins. And honestly, Lord, look at ourselves and reflect on where we were and where we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to take just a moment this morning. We've, we've got our communion with us today. And I'm just, I'm just going to ask Sandy to play over here just a, 
quietly if you don't mind. So y'all just bear with us uh, before we before we sing. For Jesus on the night of his betrayal, he took bread and he took some wine. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And this is my blood that was shed for you. And for those of you that have the, the cup, you all can see the wafer is on top and the, you'll have to peel that off. But before we do that, I want to take just a moment for Sandy to play and sing the gift of love. Father, we thank you for your love. And God, we thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, which proved your love for us. And I ask you, God, to forgive us of our sins. And let us return to you, Lord. And we pray that you bless these elements here today. Make them be for us the body of Christ, as we might be the body of Christ for the world. And the blood of Christ, Lord, that was shed for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. Does everyone have one of these? Need one? Let us know. The body of Christ, broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. As the acolyte gets ready to take the light, we're going to sing a song. And I just want to say today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up a countenance upon you and bless you. This is we're singing number 557, verses 1 through 4 of Blessed Be the Tithe of Tithes. 